please join me in welcoming James Staten. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Jim. Great, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back here and participating with you guys. I was at the, Jonathan talked about the very first OpenStack Summit. Um, I was at that one as, and the second one. So it's good to see that this section over here, you guys were the attendees at the first one and we've grown it quite a bit, which is fantastic. Um, now, I love the way Jonathan started this out because one of the things he talked about when he talked about sort of the best practices to do with your OpenStack implementation, he talked very much about have an idea about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Understand what the developers are actually looking for and treat it as an opportunity for innovation. Those are all really important things to say. And what's common about all the things he said? They have nothing to do with configure the technology this way, choose this hardware, do this type of uh, study. It has nothing to do with the technology. And that is really important because the biggest challenge we continue to see when it comes to private cloud implementations is that the focus needs to be on organizational psychology more than on the technology. And most of you wouldn't be here in this room if you felt that OpenStack wasn't ready for implementation. The challenge is most IT departments aren't ready. And part of this comes down to the relationship that IT departments have with developers. More often than not, they really don't have a very strong knowledge about what developers are looking for, why they consume the public cloud services that they do. And they also don't have really good relationships with the line of business, who more often than not are the ones who are trying to drive the innovation, and therefore are the people that are going out and using SaaS services, public cloud services, and circumventing IT with their shadow IT initiatives to take advantage of this. So the first thing all the IT administration teams should do is concentrate on understanding why your company's employees are circumventing what you provide. And when you look at surveys from Forrester, from Gartner, from other organizations, you tend to see the same thing. You tend to see this list of the reasons they go out and use the public cloud. And these are all pretty straightforward. We're all pretty familiar with these. But what's not on this list? This is what's not on this list. Developers in line of business are not looking to IT any longer to say, where should I deploy this? They are not waiting for IT to confirm that it is compatible and it works with the things that IT is running in the data center. They're frankly not going to the cloud because it's cheaper. So those in IT who feel like that's what I've got to do, I've got to be the cheapest solution out there, no. If you looked at the previous list, it's about speed, it's about innovation, it's about empowering the productivity of developers at the skill sets that they have. That's what's really most important. And notice the last one, they actually don't care whether IT supports that solution. Now you might read that and then you say to yourself, well, wait a second, if they don't want my support, then what, what's going on here? Did I do something wrong? Um, am I not relevant to the business going forward? Well, that's something we all have to pay attention to because the old definition of IT is under pressure from the changes that are coming into the organization. IT is still held responsible for the security and the privacy, managing our assets, ensuring that people are not taking our assets and sending them out into the public, um, they're not taking our intellectual property or our patents and tweeting them out so everybody can read them. All of that's still really important. But IT is no longer in charge of the services and capabilities that are being leveraged by the business. And as much as IT wants to be back in charge, you no longer are in a position where you can say, thou shalt not public cloud. So when you're not in a position in which you can stop people from doing things, you have to rethink your role. Um, and you also have to think about your relevance too, because if you sort of say, well fine, they've gone, they wanna use all the services that are out there, let them go for it, um, when they screw up, the, then they, and they, you know, get our intellectual property in trouble or they share some information about our customers and that gets in trouble, well, they're the ones who are gonna get fired. No, because again, IT's role is to protect the assets, which means you have to be on board with how technology is being used in your company and you have to shift the role of IT away from the role of we make the technology to we help our company use the technology. 
Now, when we look at private clouds, IT departments typically look at a private cloud as a linear progression upward from the things they already do. They've already run the operating system and the infrastructure. Now they've put virtualization on top of it. Um, a private cloud to them is more standardization, more automation of the environment. And usually about that point is when they say, done, private cloud. Now, that's probably a pretty big mistake because, as we talked about at the beginning, you need to understand what your developers want. And developers look at a private cloud from the top down. They will look and they will say, is it self-service? Does it allow me to tap into these resources myself, not fill out a form, wait six weeks, and then you give me some VMs? Does it allow me at my skill set to be able to drop applications in here and scale them out horizontally? Can I take advantage of this platform like I would take advantage of the public cloud services? So if IT declares victory, our private cloud is automated, and they do not provide self-service, they do not provide the ability to scale it horizontally, it's going to get rejected. And if you saw Tom Bittman's recent survey, he's an analyst at Gartner, where he talked to a whole audience of people at a Gartner conference about their private cloud initiatives, what did that survey show? He asked how successful your cloud is. How much is your private cloud being used? And the response that came back, 95% of the respondents said our private cloud is failing. This is the reason. So it's not that OpenStack was the wrong stack. It's not that they chose the wrong technology to do this. It's that they didn't understand the value proposition and build the product to the requirements of the organization. And that means that they are running the risk of being circumvented yet again. And if you build a private cloud and no one comes to use it, it's not a field of dreams unless you like nightmares. So we have to really say IT needs to change its role, its point of view, how it interacts with the organization going forward. And most importantly, I've, it's, it's been a really long time since I ran into an IT professional who said, when I got out of college and I decided to join IT, I was dying to run that 1995 SAP system. I just love working on yesterday's technology. That's awesome. Unfortunately, some of those do exist. They're usually about a year away from retirement. But for the rest of us, the reason we got into IT was because we wanted to do this. We wanted to bring new ideas. We wanted to evangelize technology for our companies. We wanted to help the company innovate. We wanted to help the company transform. So let's do that. Let's step up. It's time to do that. The technologies are here. But in order for us to do this, we have to look at the IT department differently. We have to recognize that some of the skill sets, some of the focuses, some of the roles, some of the responsibilities have to change. And this is exactly what happened in Microsoft when Satya came in and said to our IT department, we were going to be a mobile first and a cloud first organization. We are going to allow our employees to bring Macs into the office. We're going to put all of our applications on iOS and on Android. We're going to be wherever our customers and wherever our employees are, and we're going to make sure they're productive in all of those environments. And you guys in IT, you're going to have to empower that. So that was a little bit of a shock to an IT department that was 100% on one platform and ran things out of their own data center. And they knew this thing was going on over in the cloud division, this thing called Azure, but they weren't really sure how to tap into it and take advantage of it. And so they started paying attention to that. So when they did that, they looked inside and they said, we've got a series of skills and orchestra org structures around our traditional data center architecture today. And when we say we're going to move to a cloud first model, there's some changes we got to make. Yes, we still need technical people. But what they manage, how they're organized, what they pay attention to, that changed. So we don't need, in this new cloud-first world, people who necessarily own specific parts of infrastructure. We don't need the handshake that goes between the server guy, the networking guy, and the storage guy in order to get things done. We need to actually think about, we are the managers of services that we provide and managers of services that our employees are going to tap into. And that means that we have to change what we focus on. And biggest change overall 
was instead of working on and managing commodity te technologies, we now have to engage the business and understand how they're using these services and how we can empower them to use the services more effectively. And that was the biggest part of the change in our IT department. And we're not done by any means. You know, this takes a long time because you'll run into people who say, well, I've always defined my role this way. I have all these skills. I have these certifications. I know these tools incredibly well. What do you mean I have to change? Well, as part of that, it's important that IT leaders take an active role in helping their employees see what is that career path. Where are their skills applicable in the new world? And that's a big part of what Microsoft IT has been focusing on as well. So we had a series of roles that you see at the top of the board here. Um, you've probably seen these same roles inside your organization. And they found that there were a series of new roles that you see at the bottom of this page that they needed to move people into. In some cases, like the last one up there, the DBA, well, when you are tapping into cloud-based SQL database, you don't set up and, and configure the database, nor do you set up and configure the database cluster. That's done. So if you're a DBA, what's your future? Well, think about the skills a DBA has. Think about what he's really good at. He may be really good at information management. He may be really good at metadata management. He may be really good at understanding how to pull information out of the database and become someone like a data scientist. Now, he's going to need some training. He's going to need some new certification to get to those roles. But by helping him see the path forward, then he can make the right choice. And one thing that we learned very early in this process is there is no one-to-one -one relationship. There's not, you're a DBA, you're going to this box below. You're a server administrator, you're going to this box below. The key is to say, here are the new roles that are out there, here's the skills, here's the capabilities necessary, and give people the options. And what we found in Microsoft IT was there was a whole lot of moving around. There were people who had the right talents and skills to engage with the business and get to know them really well. There were other people who really weren't people people and kind of wanted to stay behind a CLI. There's a role for them as well. There were people who really wanted to be students of technology. They loved getting deeper and deeper into this, and they started building out capabilities that we needed in other areas. At the end of the day, though, IT's responsibilities we talked about before, they are still there. It is still the job of the IT department to ensure our assets, protect our customer information, and ensure that no matter where we use technology and how we use it, that we're able to do that in a safe fashion. And so we quickly came to the conclusion through MSIT, as well as a lot of the customers we talked to, that there were you know, two big changes and two big roles that had to be taken care of. And one of those roles was, if they're going to use any and every technology that's out there, how do we ensure that they do it safely? And that led us to create the Enterprise Mobility Suite, which says our employees and the people that use our tool for their employees can access any cloud service that they want. They can do it with their single sign-on with their existing identity inside of the company, which means that I can give them a self-service portal to all the SaaS services they could tap into. I can have them assigned to the roles and the groups with the responsibilities and rights that they have inside the company, and those carry forward out into the services that they tap into. And it allows us to see patterns of use so that I can identify, because I have single sign-on, because I have centralized identity that's stored in the cloud, that if Jonathan logs in, from Shanghai, and then 15, made it, 15 minutes later, logs in from Israel, that's probably not him. And there's probably something going on. And maybe I should make sure that the assets he was trying to get access to, we hold back for a little bit. And maybe I can turn now on two-factor authentication, or turn on an additional factor, so that if next time he logs in, I can verify that it's really him. And then I'll know, is he really in Shanghai? Is he really in Israel? Or is he actually just here in Mountain View? Um, it sure would be nice to know that. And that becomes a very different role than the person before who said, well, we're, we're a iPhone shop and you can't have an Android. Um, it's a very different role than the person who says, well, well, there'll be no Dropbox used in this company. It becomes much more empowering because more often than not, when we find that employees go out and they use these services in the cloud, it's not because they don't like IT. It's not because they don't feel that IT understands their needs. It has everything to do with what they're trying to do in their job. 
We go out and we create accounts in these places because we think they're gonna deliver greater productivity and they have a service or a capability or a function that's necessary for our business so we can make more money, be more profitable, be more responsive to our customers. And that's the last thing IT should get in the way of. But we look like we're in the way when we don't ask, why are you using this? What's the value that comes from this? It also eliminates the opportunity for us to say, I see why you're using that service. Did you know internally we have a service that does exactly that? Because a lot of times your employees don't know what capabilities you have internally. But also don't get too excited about the fact that you might be able to expose them to things you do. How you implement those services might hold them back. So it's really important to engage deeply with the customers, with the employees, understand why they use these technologies, and shift from being the department of no to be in the department of know-how and empowerment. Now, this is mostly on the client side that we've talked about this so far, but the same is true on the operational side. And this is a big reason why you have to really focus on having people in your organization who can be the central operations team to identify and manage and help secure the workloads you deploy anywhere you deploy them. Deploying them on VMware, deploying them to your private cloud, deploying them to the public clouds. You should have the ability to do log analytics, the ability to ensure the availability of the applications, to ensure the performance of the applications, back up those applications, do disaster recovery in those applications from one central location. And this is really critical because you can't, you can't go to the developers and say, hey, that's a really interesting app you have up there. That's going to use personal identifiable information, so it has to come back here in the data center. You're not going to win that argument. Now, you might if you work for a bank, but don't expect to win that argument in four years because we already see the financial industry, we see the healthcare industry, we see a bunch of other companies in regulated areas using public cloud services and moving their data and assets out there. What you should be thinking about is how can I ensure the protection and security of those assets wherever they go? Because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. Um, my favorite story to talk to a lot of customers about is they will say to me, you know, we're, sorry, we're not gonna put anything in the public cloud. Uh, that pertains to either our financial information or to our customer information. And then I say, do you use salesforce.com? Oh, of course. Oh, okay, just wanted to be, just wanted to check. So these are the realities that we in IT need to wake up to and be a part of and participate in. So whether we're going to be putting OpenStack internally into our organization, we're gonna tap into public clouds, we're going to be hybrid in the way we deploy our applications, be the smart IT department that says, yes, you can use these services, and I know how to manage them and track them and be successful with them. That's the way that IT is gonna move forward. So thus ends the organizational psychology lecture of the day, and I look forward to all your questions on this topic. So thanks so much for your time.